All right, we're going to get started. <clears throat> It won't be there, you're positive. Yeah. Great, I'm uh, Federico Castellucci, and we are here for one of the first ever Google Plus on-air Hangouts. I'm here with my head barkeep, uh, Chris Dobson, uh, as well as some other folks in the Hangout here that I wanna go ahead and introduce. Uh, we have Charlie, who's a local food blogger here in Atlanta, from our libaceous nature. Uh, we have Doug here. Doug, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Doug, uh, owner of Kaleidoscope Bistro and Pub in Brookhaven, Atlanta. And uh, I play guitar too. Clearly a guitar enthusiast. Uh, and then we have Harrison here. Harry, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, thanks, Fred. Uh, my name's Harry. I'm big into snowboarding, modest mouse, and I'm a perpetual grad student. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, and then Mandy. Hey everybody, I'm Mandy and I work at Melissa Libby and Associates here in Atlanta and I do social media. Sounds great. And finally, uh, Michael. Uh, hey guys, uh, I wish I was a perpetual grad student, but I'm excited to learn a little bit more about cocktails. Sounds great. So we're going to get rolling here. Uh, Chris is going to make a few cocktails for us. Uh, the first one that we're going to be uh, rocking out here is a classic Manhattan. To me, this is one of my favorite classic cocktails. Chris can definitely attest that I consume quite a few of these. This is our take on a top shelf Manhattan. So without further ado, I'm gonna let him start rolling into it. Cool. So the Manhattan itself almost is the epitome of classic cocktails. Um, a little bit of background on the Manhattan. Uh, the myth is it was created in the 1870s at the Manhattan Club, actually for a uh, presidential candidate at the time. Um, this is a rye whiskey based cocktail and we're going to feature High West's Boo Rye in this cocktail. This is the only bourbon rye blend uh, known in the world. Um, this is a 10 year straight bourbon, a 12 year straight rye, and a 16 year straight rye. So without further ado, we're going to start on the cocktail. I like a 3 to 1 ratio uh, in this cocktail, 3 being the rye whiskey and 1 being the sweet vermouth. So we're going to start with the three ounces in our glass. So where is this uh, product made, High West? High West actually comes out of Utah by a gentleman named David Perkins who grew up in Atlanta. How about that? So those Mormons really like their, uh, their whiskey. <laughs> David actually was in here a few months ago and I had a chance to pick his brain over his uh, product. Um, and anytime you got the, uh, the big gun in here, uh, and it makes a world of difference. So I learned a lot of stuff about his product in particular. So next we have the Barolo Chinato. Um, this is one of the top uh, sweet Italian vermouths I've ever found. Um, this is a Barolo base, which means that they use VOCG Barolo wine and infuse it with quinine bark and other uh, t up to 21 other spices and plants in here. So uh, generally speaking, how much would this bottle cost if you were to go out and buy it in the store? Uh, this is about a $55, $60 bottle of uh, vermouth. So compared to your average Martini and Rossi, uh, you know, seven or eight bucks a pop, this is some pretty <laughs> serious stuff, so. This is definitely a uh, step up, but uh, the name of the game is certainly quality and precision. Uh, and that's why you will see us use our jiggers for uh, the precision in this cocktail. Um, the idea is that you can come in today and get this uh, Double Zero Manhattan from myself and come back four months later and get it from another barkeep and it'd be the exact same cocktail. Um, and we kind of preach that throughout Double Zero in our other restaurants. So the last ingredient um, that we're gonna add into this is Bitter Cube's Orange Bitters. Uh, I think they do a phenomenal job with their bitters in particular um, that they come from uh, the industry. Um, these two gentlemen that actually were barkeeps throughout the week uh, started playing around with their bitters and really blew up on the national scene. Uh, as you can see, I jumped on board as well. So we take two dashes of these orange bitters and add to our cocktail. Um, as you see, we use droppers, and this goes back to the precision aspect of this cocktail. So every dash is six drops, so I, get, I like to get around 12 drops in this cocktail. Good to go. That looks like a pretty precise measurement. What would you say uh, a droplet is uh, equal to? You know, that, um, 
that's why they're actually in dashes. Once you get to a dash, you're talking probably a quarter of a teaspoon. Um, the drops themselves are so minuscule, but make such a drastic difference. Um, we go by the dashes for that reason. So this cocktail, as you can see, uh, in this clear glass, we're going to add ice to this, and it's stirred. Uh, very rarely will you see a Manhattan bruise. If it is bruised, it's for personal preference. I highly uh, advise against bruising in Manhattan, just for the sole reason of the product in here. So when you say the word bruise, for those that don't know that terminology, what, is it, what exactly does that mean? So essentially bruise is actually throwing this in here, grabbing a shaker, and shaking the crap out of it. You're gonna have a nice uh, frothy layer over the top. So if somebody likes something really chilled, a lot of ice chunks, um, which is really like a gin martini drinker, that's what they're looking for. The only problem with that is you're diluting the cocktail when you shake it like that. Whereas here, we're going to stir this, and it's really gonna cut through the booze in here instead of diluting it. We're gonna have uh, as minimal uh, water in the cocktail as possible. That's kind of the idea with this. So I like to get about 20 to 25 different repetitions in here. And you'll know when it starts to get cold because you're holding it and it gets cold and you don't want to hold it anymore. So you, is there like a specific technique that you're using here? Because it seems like you're doing it in a very specific way. Yeah, that's a good point too. So with your bar spoon, you're essentially wanting to rub the back of the spoon around the glass in a circular motion. Now everybody has their different techniques with this, with the spoon. I hold it a certain way. That's easy for me to get that circular rhythm. When you get out of that rhythm, that's when you start diluting your Manhattan. It's bad news. You might as well bruise it at that point. So I take my uh, handy dandy Hawthorne strainer, which is essentially uh, to keep all the ice that we can out of this cocktail, going back to the dilution part of it. I like my Manhattan served up in a martini glass. Usually seven to seven and a half ounce glass. And so now this is where we get to the part. This is this is what I do around here. And so I just drink and taste these cocktails. And good morning. It's it's not quite noon yet, but <laughs> delicious. There's not not a better Manhattan out there. That's it, guys. That's our uh, double zero Manhattan. Uh, we're really proud of that, as uh, Fred can attest to it. Puts back a few here and there. Yeah, definitely. All right, so uh, group, let's uh, turn it over to you guys. You got any questions or anything from the Hangout? Where's the cherry? Doug? Doug? Hey, Doug. <laughs> Don't you have to have a cherry to make it a Manhattan? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so with your Manhattan, a lot of people are running a maraschino cherry in that. But a maraschino cherry to me screams cheap. So what we like to do it's actually at a griot cherry. These griot cherries are marinated in a metaxa brandy, which really comes down to a high-end brandy um, cherry. So this is actually made in France, a griot cherry. You can get these at a, uh, a Whole Foods or a higher-end supermarket. Um, you're not gonna find this at your Publix, Kroger, or anything of sort, but it's a great question with the cherry. Doug, I got a little excited and I wanted to drink it before I could even drop the cherry in, so <laughs> thanks for keeping us honest I over there. That's the, the, the full effect. <laughs> Any other questions? So, if you're not if you're not in the industry, where would you find some of the specialty ingredients like uh, like the bitters that you were used to? Like the burai. So where would you find some of these ingredients if you were uh, if you're not in the industry, you don't have access to yeah, I mean, our like distributors? Yeah, I mean, some of the other uh, ingredients. Yeah, that's definitely a great question. So obviously, if you're ever in Utah, you're gonna find your burai. But if not, for most of us that live in Atlanta. Um, you really need to go to a high-end liquor store that you trust. Um, your everyday uh, guy down the street at the package store is not going to carry this, um, as you were mentioning to. Go into a place that you respect. If they don't have it, they'll order it for you be there in the next few days. Um, the only problem with that is sometimes you'll have to buy two to three bottles at a time. It's definitely well worth it. I would jump on it, as this product is usually in limited production. Um, this is actually one of the last bottles of Boo Rye that we have here as they've cut off the production of this. So uh, stock up while you can. All right, so uh, we'll move into the next cocktail here. So we're gonna make a classic Sazerac, another one of my favorite uh, classic cocktails here. This is a cocktail that has originated in uh, the great state of Louisiana. And I'll let Chris take you over uh, and teach about this one real quick. 
Cool. So, like Fred mentioned, uh, this is actually the national drink of New Orleans. Um, it's actually gone through Senate a few times to get to that point where they legally can say that. When you go into New Orleans, when you go into the Sazerac bar or anything of sorts, um, this is the first cocktail that kind of screams out at you. This is the classic, harsh, gentleman's cocktail in particular. So we're going to stick with the High West uh, Brew Rye for this cocktail base. Just because it has enough oomph behind it with the 12 year and 16 year uh, straight rides in here. So I like uh, an ounce and a half in this cocktail. And we're gonna build this just like we did with the Manhattan. Right in the glass, and we're gonna stir it when we get there. So the next ingredient is actually Cavassier's VS. It's very special for anybody that does not know uh, VS stands for. We're gonna add an ounce of this. And this is kind of to take off a little bit of that rye harshness in the palate. Now I've seen a lot of different Sazerac recipes out there. Uh, is and a lot of different variations. What kind of makes this one different from some of the other variations that are out there? No, that's a great point. The uh, difference in the Sazerac that we're going to use today is that we're actually going to add half an ounce of a one-to-one -one ratio simple syrup, and we're going to add a little bit of an absinthe rinse. Um, when this cocktail was originally created, absinthe was legal in the United States, so you saw that. But after the uh, 1920s and Prohibition, you didn't see absinthe anymore here. So you saw a lot of herb strain uh, and really fake absinthe in general. So we're back to a uh, bohemian absinthe called Matahari. It's 120 proof. Uh, this is no joke. This is going to get the point across in our cocktail. And that's really the two ingredients that separate us. Um, the other ingredient is we're going to add a chunk of ice to the Sazerac, which is kind of like a 50-50 uh, thing. You either add it or you don't. Um, and when we get to that point, we use the real ice, as uh, Fred has here right now. This is not the cheap cubes you get out of uh, an ice dispenser. So the next two ingredients we have are your most commonly used bitters in the world, Angostura bitters. We're gonna do one dash of this, so about six drops. And then the second of the two bitters, bitters is the Peychaud's bitters. It's actually created by Dr. Peychaud, who here and there is given credit to creating the Sazerac cocktail in itself. So we'll add a dash of that. And we're going to leave this right here for just a second. So we're going to go to our next step in the cocktail, which actually involves the absinthe itself. So what we do with our Matahari is essentially take a rinse to the glass. So we've got the absinthe in here. And so how much would you say you just poured in there? You know, it's probably about a teaspoon, I would say. You need enough to coat the glass. Because if you're gonna do it, you might as well get that anise flavor going. So after that, we have enough absinthe in here. I'm gonna dump a little bit out, I would say probably half. But you've got enough in here to light a good flame. So you've got your flaming glass going on right here. It's heating up, it's bringing out that anise flavor in the uh, Sazerac. And on top of that, it looks really cool. And anytime you can play with fire and look cool behind the bar, it's a bonus. I would definitely burn myself. <laughs> so we drop our solid ice block in here for dilution purposes. And so how do you, uh, how do you get those ice blocks? I mean, how, do you, how would you go about making those? And that's a great question. I've tried many times actually making this ice. It never works. So what do we do? We found somebody that makes it for a living. They do this 24-7. Um, it's a local company, Atlanta Ice. They do a phenomenal job. It's worth the money to do it if you're going to get into the business. Um, this is distilled water that they actually freeze. It's phenomenal. It comes in about uh, three-foot blocks. And we actually go to town on it with an ice pick. And we carve up the block the way we're looking for it. And we break down the blocks. We break down the blocks. And we chip at it on the other side of the ice pick and get it to the size that we're looking for for the cocktail. So back to the Sazerac, we're going to do the same rhythm that we put with the Manhattan, about 20 to 25 different repetitions. Get that nice chill on it. And as you're doing this at home, you'll feel it on the side of the glass. It'll start to chill for you pretty quickly. Take the Hawthorne strainer again. We're gonna keep all the ice in here because I already have enough ice in the, uh, in the glass. And 
Now you use uh, simple syrup, and tell me a little bit about how you make that. If somebody at home was trying to make simple syrup, how would you go about doing that? You know, the simple syrup itself is actually a uh, one-to-one ratio uh, that we use. So what you do, you actually have this container. You'll take half of this with sugar, and you'll fill up the other half with almost boiling water. And all you do is you shake it. And that's why it's called simple syrup. So we're actually going to add a quarter ounce of that right over the top. If you'll run it over the back of a bar spoon, it'll actually layer right on top and dissolve evenly in the cocktail. So as that's running down, we only have two things left to do with this. The first is an orange flame. So what we're going to do is we're going to heat up this orange flame on both sides and it's really going to bring the oils out of the rind to the surface. Hold it to the glass, but be sure not to squeeze it beforehand because squeezing it be beforehand releases all the oils. Hold your flame up to the glass and squeeze. It's that easy. Rim your glass. And do the exact same process with your lemon peel. Looks delicious. So while he's finishing this up, uh, guys, what do you uh, have any questions, comments? So I have, a, I have a question. So I frequently find myself in situations where I'm taking somebody out on a date and trying to look cool. And I'm wondering kind of what would be a good question to ask the bartender or, or a good like request to make of my Sazerac so it kind of looks like I know what I'm doing. So basically Harrison wants to know, look good in front of a lady on a date and uh, not look stupid in front of the bartender. So what's a... Uh, there's, there's actually one easy trick to a Sazerac. Ask him for the best rye whiskey that he carries as your base in the Sazerac. That's all you need to say. Because that lets him know you know what you're talking about. That also lets your date know that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> all right, sound advice. Anybody else have anything to uh, add? I guess not. <laughs> Well, at this point, we'll conclude our little. Uh, or oh, hey, Mike. Bartending school. I can't hear you. Very cocktail specific question, but what's up? What's the training like to become a bartender in your position? You know, that's an interesting question because what we do behind our bars and the craft cocktail bars is certainly different than you see at a, a lot of nightclubs, um, your college shop bars, and whatnot. Um, to be honest with you, I highly uh, recommend going into a bar with no experience like ours and learning from the bottom up. If you come in with a bartending school certificate or anything of sorts, you almost turn us off and turn us away. Um, it's easier to teach you from the bottom when you don't know anything versus retraining you completely. That takes a lot of time um, and effort to get you back up to speed. So that's a great question. Uh, I've always said finding a good job in the bar industry is purely luck. Great, so with that, we'll uh, conclude our uh, first ever Google Plus on-air hangout. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to Google. This is uh, really cool, a lot of fun. If you have any questions, check us out online at Google Plus. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks guys. Cool. It's really interesting.